UChicago's Harris School of Public Policy offers credential programs that suit any schedule to upskill quickly. Earn credentials in data analytics, international finance, writing, and analyzing the election results. Explore our five to seven week courses taught by world-class faculty. Add to your professional toolkit in 2021. Learn more at harris.uchicago.edu slash credentials. The 2020 election, for all intents and purposes, is over. After four long, tense days, we've reached a historic moment in this election. Results from the state of Pennsylvania, those results are in right now, and based on what we are seeing there. The Fox News decision desk can now project that Joe Biden has won the Keystone State, Pennsylvania. Biden is president-elect of the United States. It's hard to think of a recent presidential election that has raised more questions than this one. With the highest turnout for both candidates, what message are the American people sending to their elected officials? Why did the polls again get it so wrong? And what will the Joe Biden presidency actually look like? To get answers, we turn to two of the top experts that we know. The part that we should remember, because I think is very important, is that the country has given a enormous proof of democracy. The, the participation has been unprecedented. Luigi Zingales is a professor of economics at the University of Chicago and host of another University of Chicago podcast network show, Capital Is It. We're also joined by Will Howell, chair of the University of Chicago Political Science Department and host of yet another University of Chicago podcast network show, Not Another Politics Podcast. The fact that the Republicans are likely to maintain control of the Senate, that they've picked up seats in the House. They have a six to three majority in the Supreme Court. This is not a table that's been set for a, a Democratic president with a really ambitious, progressive agenda. It's a University of Chicago podcast network election special, and this is Big Brains, a podcast about the pioneering research and pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. On this episode, getting a grip on the 2020 election. I'm your host, Paul Rand. All right, terrific. Well, first off, thank you for uh, joining on what has been an absolute roller coaster of a period of time. I wonder if if each of you can recall what your first thoughts were as the election results began rolling in and, and uh, how did they proceed during the week? Will, why don't we start with you? Well, I think we learned something early on, and that was followed by a long, agonizing period of uncertainty. So what we learned early on is that we weren't going to have a, a repudiation of Trump. And then, you know, I figured we weren't going to learn anything for a few days, so I went to bed, uh, okay. woke up in the middle <laughs> of the night, checked my phone, and saw that Trump had declared victory and thought, this is the worst possible scenario, right? This is This is what we feared. Now... I think we've crawled back from that moment, not just in terms of, you know, the vote totals, but also in terms of that sense of precarity. We're on on sounder ground right now than we were then, but it was pretty harrowing. Well, I, I know from your podcast that you're a, a huge Taco Bell fan. Did you at any point feel this urge to run out and get a giant bean burrito or anything like that? You know, the bean burrito is good, but I like the, for a festive night like election night or what's meant to be festive, you want to mark the occasion, I like the nachos, I like the crunchy Taco <laughs> Supremes and a burrito Supreme, and that's what I had. The crunch is pretty critical for celebration, isn't it? It really is. And what's yeah. really critical is the hot sauce. You can't go Absolutely. <laughs> well, Luigi, as, as, as and I know you, you could talk about food all day long as well. What, what uh, as you recalled this happening on, uh, on election night, what were your thoughts running through your head? Uh, I was wondering how could pollster have screwed up a second time this much? This thing about polling, it, clearly it was not all wrong, but it, it wasn't anywhere near the sweep or the wall that was projected. And I wonder if you have any ideas why. I, I guess I'd want to say two things about the polls. The first thing I'd want to say is that they got it wrong at the state level more than they got it wrong at the national level. It was a decisive win at the national level when you look at the popular vote. It's at the state level that you have things right, break right. down. And this is in the aftermath of all kinds of trend lines making life more difficult for pollsters. 
Fewer and fewer people answer the phone, right? Getting representative samples are hard. When you have response rates of somewhere between four and 8%, it's awfully hard to say, to generalize to any population. To my mind, a key thing that's happening, I mean, a lot of people point to the difficulties of figuring out who the likely voters are. I think what's happening rather is that getting representative state samples is hard because everybody's on their cell and then you carry the cell number when you leave the state. And so mm -hmm. just, so I think that's a big, that's a big part of it. The other thing that I want to say though, is that I hope that this, all the kind of energy that we pour into horse race conversations and the extent to which we look at pollsters as being kind of tribunes of the people and beacons of, of, of light that we should kind of bow before. I hope we, we disavow ourselves of that. And campaigns are, un, if not unique moments, then certainly rare moments for the country to come together and ask hard questions and speak across difference. And instead, we obsess about polls and right. we have very little to show for it. Well, well, Luigi, I don't. How do, how do you feel about that? Because I think we're never going to want to give up our uh, at least perception that we can see around corners, are we? No, that's for sure. And this is is a little bit like in the stock market, which we, we chase uh, what are going to be next day earnings just before they are announced. And right. I think is it's not a particularly high social value activity, but is an activity that is uh, compensated very well. Uh, it's compensated very well in the stock market. It's compensated very well also in the polls market. And most pollsters, in my view, make money by telling stories that customers want to listen rather than getting it right. I think the other big issue is that people are afraid to say they're going to vote for Trump. I saw a poll that says that 45% of Republicans are afraid for their job to reveal that they vote for Trump. That's an interesting stat. Wow. And this is particularly true among, ironically, college-educated people. It seems mm. that the, the biggest mistake is that if you look at the polls, they say that college-educated white should go for Biden with a 20% margin or something like this. If you look at uh, some exit polls, it seems that they were pretty even. So I think that that was a gigantic mistake. And it, I think this gigantic mistake is due to the fact that uh, if you are college-educated, you don't want to tell your friends that you vote for Trump. You're even less going to tell a pollster. Uh, on a pollster. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I think that's really interesting and important. My interest in exploring the phenomenon, though, has less to do with correcting the polls and more understanding what that says about our politics. Mm -hmm. That there are mm -hmm. a whole host of people who feel like they cannot openly reveal to family, to people who are anonymous to them, what their political views are. That's, that speaks substantively to this moment. And that's worth engaging. Okay, well, let, let, let's explore this question that you just went after. Why did he do so well, do you guys think? I think this is a question that Democrats need to be asking themselves for the next few years. Because if you're a centrist or you're for left of the political spectrum, you look at this cascade of offenses and think, how is it possible that the electorate puts up with this? And the issue is regularly framed as a willingness to look the other way amidst one offense or another. Um, and I guess what I'd suggest is that, no, there are people who really like this man, who find meaning in him, who who believe that he is he speaks for them. And to my mind, a big part of it has to do with the rise of populism in American politics. Luigi, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, first of all, I have to say I'm at disadvantage here because uh, Will is a political science professor. Uh, I'm not going to talk to you about so, the, yeah, the stock market. I don't want to yeah, so, join you. <laughs> so, so I feel a bit uh, at a disadvantage here, but I have a, quite a different view. In a sense, uh, the only thing I strongly agree is that Democrats have to spend the next four years trying to understand that. But honestly, I think that actually many of the more moderate conservative did not like Trump. And that's the reason why he lost. For example, suburban women rejected Trump because of his demeanor. However, I think Trump has identified a need that was not uh, fulfilled in the political uh, spectrum in the United States, which is anti-free trade and socially conservative. This part was completely underserved. Actually, underserved is an understatement. was not served at all. The Democrats are too socially liberal. And the Republicans go through what are called the invisible primaries first. So they go with the rich donors and ask the rich donors for money. And if you are anti-free trade at that round, you're history. 
I don't think that Trump invented a new form of populism. Trump actually rediscover an element of democracy, that the democracy is there to create demand from a representative to represent the interest of the people. I think that the fact that the Republicans held on and did reasonably well is further evidence that this most recent election wasn't a huge repudiation of Trump, that people who stood close by or were willing to either accommodate or enable Trump were not punished at the polls, I think as many Democrats hoped that they would be. I disagree that Trump assumed a set of widely popular positions, that Luigi, the, the characterization of a set of people who whose voices were not adequately heard in our politics, I think is, is fair, but I don't think that broadly the public was looking for big tax cuts for corporations and for people who are the highest earners, or looking for a wall to be built on the southern border, or we're looking for a trade war with China, or we're looking for a more relaxed stance you know, vis-a-vis you know, Russia. Trade war on, a trade war on China, I, I disagree. On the other one, you're absolutely right. But, but, the, but the, the position on China, and you know, I'm not endorsing what Trump has done on China, but the elite, particularly the economic elite, has been completely of trade is great, and make a sense of it. And this has devastated the Midwest and these people are angry and they are rightly angry for that. Yes. Because of jo- so job losses, agree with of course. That. I completely agree with that. Yes, yep. the anger and the disaffection and the sense that the system is broken is something that he tapped into. And to my mind, that is part of both the popular, the populist kind of strategies that, and the rhetoric that he deploys and helps explain the anti-democratic, small-d democratic posture that he has assumed throughout his presidency and why he constitutes a very real threat to democracy. Um, It isn't just somebody who has assumed a different set of positions or is like a new brand of Republican. He's somebody who has pushed back in all kinds of really important ways against democratic institutions, democratic norms, democratic practices. That's a constituent feature of his presidency. He's not just kind of a a new guy who's you know rethought a couple of positions that then has attracted some additional votes. So the, so the Democratic Party is now going to sit down. I can only imagine not only trying to get ready to transition, but they're having some of these same conversations of what do we learn out of this? And we've got another two years. We might be able to flip some additional seats after you get past January in, in uh, Georgia. What, what, are the, what are the Democrats learning from this? What do you think they need to learn out of it? And do you think they will? This is where I I agree with a number of things that Luigi said. I think that they need to recognize that significant portions of the American public have suffered under a set of policies involving open free trade, rise of globalization, automation, that they haven't stepped in in a meaningful sense, in a a kind of robust sense, and said the government hasn't served you well, and I'm going to stand by you. A big thing that I think Democrats ought to learn, not all, but a significant number of Democrats Their view is that, look, the government can solve problems, and what the public simply needs to recognize is that the government is essentially good, and that the problem that they have is a PR problem. It's a communication problem. It's about, you just don't see all the goodness that flows from the government. And that, to my mind, is a losing proposition Hmm. for the Democrats. What they ought to do is is to step up and say, you know what, The, the government in many ways is broken. In many ways, it has been an abject failure. It hasn't delivered. Um, And that isn't to say that then we ought to disavow the government or that we should somehow turn and all become libertarians, but rather the Democratic Party would do well to take some ownership of the failures of government to solve problems and to spend some attention to how they want to rebuild institutions in the service of a more effective government. Luigi, do you think that he's right in this? First of all, I think there is a distinction between what they should learn and what they will learn. Absolutely. uh, Let's first uh, start with what they should learn. I mostly agree with Will. One thing that they should learn is they push too much the identity politics. And this is in the very same California where they won by a gigantic margin, a referendum block the use of discrimination to favor disadvantaged communities. And, uh, And they lost by, I think, 56 to 44. So I think it was a pretty wide margin. So even the most hardcore Democrats don't want that as a center of the policy. The second thing, they need to understand the economic issue 
This is what is a bit tricky because they need to bypass the business elite that is behind both parties, but increasingly so the Democratic Party. Everybody thinks about the Democratic Party as the party of the people. You can't reconcile this with the fact that three quarter of the S&P 500 CEO endorsed Biden for president. The fact that Biden defeated Trump in a money raise by a huge margin and not money raised only in small donation, money raised by the big donors. The fact that the top of the administration of the Biden administration will be coming. We see already the first signs. The head of the transition team, where did that come from? Goldman Sachs. The head of uh, tech policy is the former legal uh, counselor of Facebook. And then you go down and you see that uh, this is a party that would like to be a party of the people, in fact, is the party of the elite. This soul searching of the Democratic Party is something extremely difficult, and I'm not so sure they will be able to do it, but that's what they should do. We'll take that same question and apply it to the Republican Party after the break. As the world resets, be part of the rethinking, remapping, and retooling to address society's most challenging issues. Be part of lasting change with the part-time U Chicago policy degree from the Harris School of Public Policy Evening Master's Program. Build your data science and analytical toolkit to take the next step in your career. Apply by December 15th at harris.uchicago.edu slash evening program. So Luigi and Will, what do you think the GOP should learn from Trump's loss? And more importantly, what do you think they will learn if that's a different answer? I think for, for the sake uh, more of the country rather than the Republican Party, I think that it should become a reasonable, conservative, popular party. Rubio, for example, are moving in this direction, trying not to be just the party of business and defend the business interests, but trying to respond to that demand that Trump identified. And I think that they actually have an enormous opportunity because the part we have not discussed so far is that you have a third of Asian American who voted for him. You have, uh, I think, 26% of Hispanic and 18% of black males or something like that. N numbers that were, were very hard to reconcile with some of the rhetoric uh, that Trump used, but also some of the rhetoric that the Democratic were using, that they're all racist, they're all uh, bigots, and so on and so forth. And I think that if they were to give legitimate and democratic responses, democratic with a small d, to the questions that Trump was addressing, I think that they are a, a majoritarian party in America for a long time, and they will stabilize the, the American system. The, the fear is that uh, they, as Will was saying, they flirt with these authoritarian ideas, and that would be very dangerous for the country. And I think transition that to from what you would hope they would be to what's most likely to happen, not seeing Trump and Trumpism and populism going away, these leanings, yearnings for authoritarianism, these demagogic appeals, these racialized appeals, combined with voter suppression efforts, all the work of the Republican Party when it comes to small d, you know, democracy has been about reducing the franchise, shrinking the franchise, not expanding it. And that's in no small part because they see the writing on the wall, which is a set of demographic changes, which disadvantage them and for which they, in order for them to retain their hold on power, they need a Senate. They need, they're going to start celebrating the judiciary and they need to do everything they can to push back against rising levels of turnout. Um, and so my best guess about what's going to happen is we're not going to see them taking the kind of stock that we saw them taking in the aftermath of Romney's defeat and saying, come on, people, we need to speak clearly and reach out to people who are having a hard time of it and get our senses. But rather, Trumpism will continue and to continue to push back against our democracy. And they're going to be the, to the extent that they win, they're going to be a minor, they're going to be the minority party. There's, it's not an accident that 
They're not winning the popular vote in presidential elections. And this go around, if, if Trump beats every conceivable odd and somehow takes the office, this go around, it will be in the aftermath of having lost the popular vote by five to six million people. I mean, unbelievable. Right? That's the kind of groundwork for presidential politics for some time to come. And it's only going to be weighing more in the favor of the Democratic Party. Okay, so here we go, and, and and assuming that the Democrats are not going to take the Senate as we get into uh, you know January, we're going to end up, of course, in uh, divided government. And I wonder what you think that's going to look like, Will. And we do have Biden, who's seen as this consensus builder, or is he going to have some of the same experiences with McConnell and the Senate that Obama ran into? So the fact that the Republicans are likely to maintain control of the Senate, that they've picked up seats in the House. They have a six to three majority in the Supreme Court. This is not a table that's been set for a, a Democratic president with a really ambitious, progressive agenda. There are a set of things that were talked about at length during the Democratic primaries that, as best I can tell, are off the table. We're not going to get single payer health care. We're not going to overturn the Trump tax cuts. We're not going to pack the court. That's not to say that nothing will be done legislatively. Um, there will be some things. I think we, I, we can well imagine a stimulus act put forward and taken up. I think I can well imagine some action happening on infrastructure. It'll be interesting to see whether or not any progress is made on immigration. I wouldn't expect anything comprehensive in that space. But if any, mm -hmm. if any action has happened in that space, the things with the clearest partisan valence that will be advanced are going to be things that are advanced unilaterally. So the overturning of all the deregulatory activities under the Trump administration, all that's going to be happening unilaterally. But when it comes to legislative enactments, I think we're not going to see very much. And what we do see is going to be pretty centrist. Okay. And, and so, Luigi, as we think about this, certainly Wall Street prefers this idea of a divided government. Is, is that accurate? Oh, absolutely. Because they know that nothing major will be done. And they like the status quo. Biden could try a few things. Could try, for example, an increase in the in the minimum wage. He can try to introduce a public option. Certainly, there is no way he's going to do a major reform on healthcare. But if uh, introducing a public option could be a way forward. But I agree with with Will. Is there is an enormous amount of stuff he can do from a regulatory point of view without passing any law, from the EPA mm -hmm. to, of course, what he can do at the FTC and the DOJ from a competitive point of view. I wrote, uh, before the election, I wrote a, a piece on the, the Wall Street Journal saying that the Department of Justice uh, suit against the Google was a poison pill for Biden because now Biden finds himself with uh, an open case. If he closes it, he looks like he's too weak with big tech. If he endorses it, then he finds in trouble with his donors, particularly the one of Kamala Harris. Let's remember that from day one, Kamala is running for president. Okay, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Biden is clearly a transition president. And the real game is what happened in 2024. I wouldn't count out uh, Trump in 2024, either in person or through one of his uh, kids. All right. Well, let, let, let's dig into this because I, I wonder, Luigi, if you can tell me what you think a Biden economy is going to look like. You know, this is a hundred million dollar question because nobody knows what Biden really stands for. And it's always been a moderate, but has changed a lot over his life. And also there are the circumstances. So I could see a Biden that becomes an LBJ and says, I am at the end of my career and I want to end with a bang and end with a bang making some major changes. Now, of course, the Senate is a problem along that way, but uh, at least I, there is this inspiration. There is the Biden that is cooperating with everybody in the Senate is not, not going to get very much done. But I think that there is also the, the tension, and I think this is very important for 2024, since Biden got elected by putting together a coalition that goes from AOC to Bill Crystal. The only thing that kept together this coalition is how bad morally Trump was. Okay, it was not an economic idea, it was a moral idea. And now, when you govern, morality is not enough. You need to have a common vision. And I don't see this common vision. And what I fear is that this coalition will break apart. And so the next Democratic president or presidential candidate will have to give up uh, one of the two 
wings, and that will make Kim or Ho extremely weak in a, the sort of a, a resurgent Trump uh, or Trump lookalike. So I'm interested in hearing what Luigi thinks about the relationship between economic growth under Biden and our efforts to get a handle on COVID. We haven't said COVID yet. It's clearly the number one issue that Biden plans to attend to. And I think by his account, right, the only way we get back the economy is by first getting on top of the pandemic. I think that by March uh, 2021, we will have a vaccine that people start to, to deploy and, and Biden could be faster in deploying this. In that sense, Biden has it easy because he gets on, on the way out. So I don't think he has to do a lot to get the infection under control by that time. It would be one way or another on our way down. Well, thanks for bringing up the COVID component. And, and what we're not tackling, even if we get COVID under control, is some of the bigger existential issues that are facing our world. And they almost got lost completely out of sight during this election cycle. And whether it's climate change or some of these other topics, there's been minimal to no discussions about those. Are we going to put those on the back burner for the next four years just because they are so far out and so unreachable uh, that we'll never get alignment on them? Or do you think we can actually make progress on them? I don't think, given the makeup of our federal government, that we can expect to see a robust response to climate change in the near term. But I think that both to maintain the democratic coalition and to attend to the very, you know, the reality that is climate change, Biden would do well to begin to structure conversations, much more robust conversations than we've had up until now about the problem. This isn't about him delivering, you know, his solution to Congress on day one. No Green New Deal on day one. No, that's not going to happen. Right. But he can do a whole host of things unilaterally, which have some policy value, maybe have even greater symbolic value. He can uh, talk about the issue to a greater extent. He can form commissions that then will lay out pathways to attending to this issue. He can formulate and, and, and re-enter international agreements. He can't simply ignore it simply because, you know, there's not a pathway to advancing change legislatively. He can't afford to do so either by reference to his base and keeping the coalition together or by being a responsible president, which is about attending to profound national, international challenges that significant portions of the public may not be ready yet to attend to. That's what leadership is about. We are now, what, 70-ish uh, days out um, from inauguration. But as, as you know, we still have a president who's disputing the results. As we started getting ready for this podcast, our producer was, was saying, hey, here's what happened in the last hour. You know, we have a lot of ground here before we get to inauguration. What do you project is going to happen during this period? Yeah, um, Trump has not conceded and has shown no proclivity to concede. There are no signs of the administration preparing to or being disposed to cooperate with the incoming administration. And it's too bad because there's a lot of examples of the early tenure of presidential administrations in the aftermath of chaotic transitions underperforming. And that is problematic, both in terms of the capacity of the government itself to take the actions that need to be taken, but it's also problematic in that where there is kind of chaos domestically, that creates space for other countries to misbehave. That creates space for the kind of anger and disaffection that's corroding our politics to take even deeper root. So, no, this is not just a lost opportunity. It's something that's causing real damage. I think that Trump is hard for him to face defeat. So will he be a bit crazy? Yes. The part that we should remember, because I think it's very important, is that the country has given a enormous proof of democracy. The, the participation has been unprecedented and took place in the most difficult moment in history, in the most uh, smooth way in history. And as I said, there, was, there were no disorders, there was no shooting, there was no thing. So is he going to concede? Maybe not, but who cares? This is, yes, there will be a delay in the transition. I agree with Will that uh, 
Every transition period is difficult, even under the best situation. But we know we have seen terrible transition when in 1931, 32, when Roosevelt was elected, Hoover was so desperate that went and asked for Roosevelt advice. And Roosevelt said no, because he wanted sort of uh, all the responsibility to fall under Hoover. And then the day after he took over, he put a bank holiday and make all the changes. So I think that the tension in the administration uh, change have been there for a long, long time. And uh, I don't think we need to exacerbate that. I think that uh, what I'm very happy about is that the victory is pretty clear, is not in question. So my, my biggest fear was a world in which the difference was so close that would be resolved by the Supreme Court. So you have a world in which uh, the army says uh, the legitimate president is, is Donald Trump because the Supreme Court has decided that, but uh, the rest of the country will not accept it. And then would, would have been like devastating. I don't think we are there. I don't think that, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but everybody says that there's no merit to any of the claims that he makes. And uh, at this point, I don't even see John Roberts being so crazy to defend him and go down in flames with him. So I think that uh, the transition would be much better than people expected with a lot of ugly tweets. But, you know, I, I chose not to follow uh, Donald Trump and I leave happily. But 70 million people do follow him, right? 70 million people nonetheless voted for him. I agree with you that the turnout as high as it is, is a mark in favor of democracy. And particularly that we pulled it off during a pandemic, just as we have an outcome that is reasonably clear. Thank goodness for that. When we think about the possibilities of a transition, a peaceful transition of power. But on the other side, we have a Republican Party that is silent. And there are a number of vocal members who are coming out saying, yes, keep pushing, um, that these court cases lack any merit. And yet Trump is pushing them in order to kind of, again, sow the anger, to convince lots of people that, that you know, that Biden cheated. And that when Biden assumes office, he's going to be governing, going to be asked to govern a country in which a lot of people will think, all caught facts to the contrary, a lot of people will think that in fact he did cheat. And so that's not to say that we won't make it through. I'm hopeful that we will make it through. I think that there are, uh, this could have been much worse. But boy, our, our democracy is degraded uh, by virtue of the last four years and the, the predilections of the man who's been in office. I think it's more our institutions that are degraded rather than our democracy. I think that actually our democracy is paradoxically has been strengthened because more people are participating through the electoral process, more people understand how important it is. And uh, I am a bit more optimistic because even Fox is abandoning Trump. So I think that uh, I, I'm not that, uh, that worried about uh, moving forward. What I am worried about is that... Uh, there been a lot of people fired in the administration because they were not doing what the president said, even when this was against the law. And uh, we need to go back to a normal country where you have the right to uh, disagree when this is involved uh, uh, not, and disobey when this involves breaking the law. I think that this was the country that uh, was after Watergate, in part because the people who went along paid the price and uh, the people who did not go along became the heroes. So I think that it's important to reestablish some norms and institutions. I think that uh, eight years in a row of Trump would have possibly destroyed these norms. I think now they are affected, but I think that they are still solvable. A lot of work to do going ahead here. So we are going to check back with you guys as we start looking at these things. And uh, we'll check back and see how this progresses. Really appreciate it. You bet. Thanks a lot. Big Brains is a production of the UChicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please give us a review and a rating. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap, with assistance from Alyssa Eads. Thanks for listening. Thank you.